So behavioral therapy is what we're covering this week. Behavioral therapy practitioners focus on observable behavior. What you can see me doing with my hands or any actual action that you can see, actual action, um, to using that behavior in terms of promoting change within therapy. Um, then at some point, CBT came along, so cognitive behavioral therapy came along, and you know, then what was incorporated was, hey, let's look at like behavior that is not only seen, but what are internal processes like um, things that we're thinking, um, beliefs, emotions, and let's incorporate that as part of behaviors as well, even though we can't see them, they're things that mentally are occurring that can impact behavior change as well. The major theorists here are B.F. Skinner and Albert Bandura. So we've talked about a bunch of different theories at this point in the semester. We've talked about Freud, Adlerian therapy, person-centered therapy, Gestalt, etc., etc. And so those are known as wave two, wave one. Um, and so now we're moving into what's called wave three. Think of them as phases of therapy. You know, we've talked in previous lectures as um, more and more people disagreed with Freud or wanted to explore different options in terms of therapy, more and more therapy approaches were developed. And you kind of see this explosion almost of therapy approaches that are developed as we move into this third wave of therapy. You can see here on the slide, all of the different therapy, well, some of the different therapy approaches that are developed within this wave or phase of therapy. So as we go through the, the lectures, to, uh, through the slides today, I'll talk about like, hey, this is developed. If you want to learn more about this, there's additional training or additional certification, etc., that type of thing. So let's start with classical conditioning. <clears throat> You've probably heard of Pavlov and the study he did with dogs. So, and you can see here in the, the picture on the slide that he started with an unconditional an unconditioned stimulus, so UCS, um, and it, essentially he explored and wanted to say, if I pair this with, um, you know, an, an unconditioned response, so UCR, which is salivation, salivation, sal salivation, will something occur? So essentially, if you think about a food that you really like, think about that food right now, and you know, picture it, what does it taste like? Do you notice that you're salivating? Well, that is essentially what he did here. So he noticed that dogs salivate when they are presented with food. And so he said, okay, well, if I ring this bell, this unconditioned stimulus, if I pair that with the food, will I eventually be able to ring the bell and they'll salivate even though there's no food present? And that's what happened. So, you know, he did lots and lots of studies and he would pair essentially the bell ringing with food. And as that was presented over and over, eventually dogs realized, okay, every time I hear the bell ring, that means that food is about to happen. So the dogs got to the point where if they heard the bell, they would salivate even though there was no food present. And you probably just experienced that when I said, hey, think about a food that you really like and picture it and imagine what it tastes like. You probably noticed that you salivated a little bit or that your, um, you know, your glands in your mouth started to activate. Um, <clears throat> so that's Pavlov and his study with dogs. Operant conditioning. So operant conditioning looks at reinforcement and <clears throat> think about this in terms of Anytime we do something, there's oftentimes a consequence and a consequence can either be negative, so something being added, or it can be, um, did I say negative or positive? It can be positive, something being added, or it can be a negative, something being taken away. So positive reinforcement is adding something of value to the person. So for example, if you want someone to act a certain way, so for example, you want your kid to um, studying really hard and get good grades in school. You might provide some type of positive reinforcement such as praise, such as giving them attention. Oh, good job. You're doing so good in school. I'm so proud of you. 
you might provide some type of uh, money or financial incentive. So for example, if you get all A's this semester, I will give you 20 bucks per A or something like that. So you're reinforcing positively, positive reinforcement. Um, it's a consequence because you're adding something in order to get someone to behave in, in a way that you want them to behave in. <clears throat> Negative reinforcement is um, you want to escape or avoid an unpleasant stimuli. So you want whatever that stimuli is to go away. So for example, if you don't like the annoying loud noise of an alarm clock, you may train yourself to wake up two to three minutes before the alarm goes off to avoid hearing it, right? You like you wake up and you turn the alarm clock off because you don't want to hear that annoying sound. So that's a negative stimuli. Something is being taken away or you're trying to avoid whatever that, that thing is. Extinction refers to withholding reinforcement from a previously reinforced response. So for example, when kids throw a temper tantrum, what often happens? is parents will give that child attention um, and that then re positively reinforces that behavior, right? And stop, stop throwing a temper tantrum. You can have the candy, just stop screaming. If you ignore the child's behavior though, eventually the behavior will decrease or be eliminated and that's what extinction is. Positive punishment, so again, positive something is being added to decrease whatever the target behavior is. So for example, if we were actually sitting in class and a student were texting while we were, in, we were in class, I might scold the student. That would be positive punishment. I might scold the student and say, Anne, please stop texting in class. Um, you know, it's being disruptive or it's disrespectful or whatever. That scolding is a, an example of positive punishment. Um, a timeout is, you know, putting someone in timeout is another example of a positive punishment in the hopes that that person will stop whatever misbehavior or, or whatever behavior is that they want you want them to stop doing. And then negative punishment, so again, something is being removed, such as um, taking a phone away as a behavior punishment or saying, hey, uh, you're going to lose TV time if you don't get your homework done within a certain amount of time. Or if you don't get your homework done, you're not going to be able to watch any TV or you're not going to have your phone to watch TikTok or whatever it is. So again, something is being removed um, and you're changing that behavior um, or you're impacting behavior because, you know, whoever the other person is, they don't want to lose that thing. This can probably be very help helpful for uh, you guys who have teenagers. <laughs> this is our dog, Panda. Uh, let me know. If you guys notice any of those uh, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, um, punishment, negative or positive, or if I'm just having fun with her dog. She is such a goofball. Where are your toes at? Huh? Where are your toes at? Where are your toes at? Behavioral therapy, so this is one of the exercises. So for this week, what I'm having you guys do for your discussion post is exercises. You can choose, there's several different exercises um, that you can choose from. This is one of them. There's a worksheet in Canvas, and this looks at antecedent behavior and consequence. So for example, uh, say someone, you know, a boy or girl, say a couple breaks up, that's the antecedent. And then, um, you know, I, I'll keep coming back to Anne as an example, as it's an easy name to remember or think of in terms of using different examples. So Anne and her boyfriend break up. That's the antecedent. And then behaviorally, Anne decides to go, you know, eat a whole pint of pecan ice cream. Uh, that's the behavior that she engages in. And then the consequence, there could be a number of different consequences, which could be one is maybe she feels bad about herself, like, oh, I'm going to get fat. I just ate this whole, uh, you know, pint of ice cream. Um, it could be, oh, I feel really sick. Like, I feel gross. That was a lot of ice cream to eat in one sitting. Um, so there, you can see how there's a bunch of different consequences 
another consequence should be, you know, she could say, all right, well, hey, I feel good about this. I ate ice cream. I'm going to get over it and move on and, you know, go find somebody else to date. So the consequence, again, could be positive or negative, and it could go either way, kind of depending on what the antecedent is, what the behavior is, and then, of course, who that is and how um, who they are impacts whatever the con consequence or potential consequence is. Um, and so this can be a really helpful exercise to do with clients because a lot of times, you know, we're just kind of going through the motions and we're not really paying attention to how something will happen that will impact the behavior or impact an emotion that impacts a behavior that impacts a consequence. And so it can be really useful as an exercise to try with clients and, and see like, hey, um, pay attention to what types of events are happening in your life. And then by paying attention to that event, what are the behaviors that you're engaging in? What are those consequences? Are those consequences for you positive or negative? Are they moving you towards your goals or away from your goals? Progressive muscle relaxation. So this is another exercise that can be very helpful. Again, because a lot of times we're not really paying attention to this mind-body connection or we're not paying attention to how we feel physically. And a lot of times we hold on to a lot of tension like in our shoulders or in our back or wherever you hold tension and we're not paying attention to it and so this exercise find um find one on youtube i didn't put one on here because there's a ton of different ones and so find one that you like or that you know makes sense to you or that you like the sound of the person's voice or whatever it is and um, this will go through different muscle groups so you know we'll start with like um, scrunch up the muscles in your face or scrunch up your hands and feel that tension in your hands and then release that tension and notice what it's like to release it, let it go and compare the difference essentially of being really tense versus letting that uh, tension go and, and what does it feel like and, and um, you know, pay attention to that. So this can be a really helpful exercise. Um, sometimes I'll have clients do this as an exercise, like for example, before bed to kind of decompress um, let go of some stress, move towards relaxing as they're prepping for bed. And this can be really helpful for some individuals. Um, I've gotten feedback when they've tried it of, hey, this was really helpful because it helped me, you know, relax before getting ready for bed or as part of my bedtime routine. So behavioral therapy, one of the aspects of this approach tends to be very self-directed or self-managed um, in terms of how the this approach um, views clients or views client therapist interaction. I like to incorporate SMART goals or SMARTER goals. There's several different varieties or versions of this, but essentially, as you can see, they're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. And that's because a lot of times therapy clients will come to session and they'll say something like, I just want to feel better or I just want to be happier. And I'll say, okay, well, that's very vague. How will we know that? at the end of our time together that you've actually achieved that. Um, and so through, you know, maybe I'll spend, depending on how much we've already talked about goals, we might spend a whole session just talking about what their goals are in general and specifically for therapy to come up with something that's specific. Um, so instead of saying, you know, I just want to be happier, which like, how do we measure that? How do I know what that is? How do you know what that is? How will you know once you're experiencing that or once you've achieved that? Is that something that you can even achieve? Probably not. Um, and so moving towards more, more smart goals can be helpful for us to have kind of this shared understanding and be on the same page in terms of what they're working towards, what, what we as a therapy, therapeutic team is working towards in terms of their goals for therapy. Something to pay attention to in terms of self-managed or self-directed is that paying attention to who is your client, because this might work really well for someone who comes to therapy and they're motivated and they're like, let's roll up these sleeves. We're going to get to work. We're going to, you know, make things happen. I'm here and I'm motivated. That might work really well. But for clients who come to therapy and they might be in a slump and they're just like, I'm not motivated, I, I'm not doing the things that I want to be doing, and I don't know why, and I just can't seem to get up off the couch, et cetera, et cetera. It's probably unrealistic to say, all right, go forth and be self-managed and do the things, and you're going to be awesome at this. Uh, those clients who are coming in and they're very much in a slump, they might need, they might need more guidance, they might need more support um, to kind of get over that initial slump or get out of that rut 
before they can get to a point where maybe they can be a little bit more self-managed and independent. So knowing that and knowing who your client is is going to be really helpful for us as therapists to not essentially like uh, set our, our clients up for failure if we say, you know, go do things, be self-managed. And if they're not at that point where they're ready to do that, it's kind of setting them up for failure. Systematic desensitization. So this is systematically going through whatever the stimuli is um, and having the client desensitized to it. So for example, in vivo flooding, this consists of intense and prolonged exposure to the actual anxiety um, and remaining exposed to it for a prolonged period of time, essentially to the point where the, um, the anxiety decreases on its own. So for example, um, well, I'll use the, the picture here in the slide. So I, um, heights don't scare me, but I'm not super wild about jumping off a height. Like I'm not someone who would probably ever go cliff jumping. That just, uh, my heart jumps into my throat and I don't like that, like falling sensation once you jump off of, you know, a diving board or a cliff or whatever it is. So what I've done in the past is I've gone to the pool and I've started at like the little baby, you know, like this is two feet off the floor um, or two feet above the pool. And I've started that, di that diving board. And then once that no longer causes that anxiety or that feeling of fear or that heart in my throat um, sensation, then I'll move up to the next diving board that's a little bit higher up. Maybe it's like four feet off the, um, off the floor, four, four feet above the pool. Um, and then I'll move up to the next one and then I'll move up to the next one. And by the time I've gotten up to the very highest one, you know, I might still be re really anxious. Like my, ang my anxiety symptoms might be, uh, high, but that systematic desensitization is essentially exposing myself to it over and over and over to a point where, Hey, this doesn't cause anxiety for me anymore. This doesn't bother me. I can go off the very highest, um, diving board without, you know, experiencing any type of stress or anxiety. Um, so that's essentially what systematic desensitization and in vivo flooding is. It's getting your client to the point where they're really anxious, but having them naturally come down from that. Um, imagination is the same thing, but you're just doing it in your imagination. And what are situations where we might want to do that instead of actually physically going and doing it? Well, uh, for example, individuals who have experienced some type of combat trauma or sexual assault, um, you're not going to have those clients physically go put themselves in that situation again. And so that's examples where um, having them just imagine being in that situation and how they would respond or, um, you know, staying in that situation until their um, anxiety comes down is a better um, use than, you know, we're not going to ask our clients to put themselves in any physical type of danger. Another example where this might be helpful is flying. If you have a client who is afraid of flying, it's unrealistic to say, go bo book a bunch of plane tickets and spend thousands of dollars flying around just until your, you know, your fear of flying comes down. That's not realistic. And so using imagination in that example is going to be more helpful than having a client go physically take a bunch of plane rides. Um, I already talked about kind of stair stepping it up. So starting with something really low. And so if I had a client who say is afraid of spiders or afraid of snakes, for example, I might have them start with something very um, small. I'm not going to have them jump straight to like hold a spider in your hand because that's probably going to be too much. Like that's flooding their system too much. Um, so I might have them start with like, just picture a client or here, here's a picture of a client, a, a picture of a client. Here's a picture of a spider. Look at this spider until that anxiety level comes down. Now look at a picture, uh, look at maybe a video of a spider and you know, the anxiety level comes up and then it plateaus and it comes off and it, it co naturally comes back down. Um, and so we would kind of work our way up, work our way up to the point of, okay, here is a real life spider in say a cage sitting next to you on the table or on the chair, um, you know, sit next to it until anxiety comes up, anxiety plateaus and comes back down, now hold the spider. Um, and so again, that's systematically 
going through and exposing the client to whatever that fear is or whatever that thing is that's that stimuli that produces anxiety for them is until they naturally come down. Now, you want the client to naturally come down on their own because if they get to a point where they're really anxious and then they disengage, what ends up happening is our brain tells us, oh, look, like I ran away from that situation and by running away, I saved us or, you know, we avoided death or whatever it is. And so if we disengage, going back to a previous slide, it's them positively reinforcing, um, I need to avoid this situation to avoid death or to avoid something really negative happening, which then positively reinforces the client in the wrong way. We don't want to do that. Um, and so we essentially need them to stay in that heightened level of anxiety until they naturally come down on their own because what happens then? Well, learning happens in terms of our brain to say, oh, look, I stayed in that situation. Nothing bad happened. I didn't die. I didn't break a leg. The other shoe didn't drop. Um, and so, you know, it is okay to be in this situation. It, it is okay to stand um, on the tallest diving board or it is okay to, uh, you know, um, be in a situation where I'm in, you know, maybe fear of heights, for example. It is okay to look at um, or be in a situation where I'm maybe looking at like, oh, I'm really high up without experiencing any type of harm um, or anything negative happening. And so we want the client to stay exposed and, and learn, hey, nothing bad is going to happen in this situation. So one, learning happens. And two, um, that behavior is then um, not, not positively reinforced. Um, so yes. Something to pay attention to before going into any type of exercise like this is making sure that the client has healthy coping strategies that they can engage in. Because if we expose the client and then they don't have healthy coping strategies, they might result in um, or lean on unhealthy coping strategies or coping strategies that aren't helpful and we definitely don't want that. Um, so once they come down and if they need to engage in a healthy coping strategy, we want them to have those built up and know how to use those um, when they need to or when they want to, to be able to use them. Uh, I already talked about having the client stay at that level of anxiety until they plateau and then kind of coming down. Um, and I've already talked about healthy coping strategies. Something to pay attention to when you are using this kind of exercise and is making sure that clients aren't engaging in um, unhelpful coping strategies during the process. So for example, if I, I talked about, you know, having a client who's afraid of heights. If a client is, say, going through this exercise and they are, say, afraid of heights and they get up onto a ladder, say they're, um, you know, on rung four of the ladder. If they're, you know, if they're texting or on their phone, are they really being exposed to whatever that stimuli is in this example of being afraid of heights? No, because they're using their phone as a coping strategy but in this example, it's an unhelpful coping strategy because they're using it to focus on that instead of the fact that they're on rung four of a ladder and that they're focusing on the fact that they're afraid of heights. And so that's something that you also need to pay attention to is making sure that the client isn't using um, coping strategies that maybe in other situations would be helpful. But for this situation, if they're avoiding that emotion or avoiding those thoughts that they're having, um, it's it's not helping them get through or be systematically desensitized. So that's something that we also want to make sure and pay attention to that clients aren't doing that because then it's it's either going to like just prolong the process or it's going to make this exercise not as helpful as it otherwise would be. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. So EMDR has become very popular recently. It was initially developed by Francine Shapiro in the early 2000s. It's been shown to be very effective with a variety of populations and presenting concerns. Um, it's a form of exposure therapy that entails assessment and preparation, imaginal flooding, and cognitive restructuring. Historically, what therapists would do is they would like, you know, wave their, their hands back and forth. And by doing so, it's, you know, the client's eyes are following um, to get this like cross lateralization brain activity. Nowadays, you you know, therapists don't have to do this the whole session. Now they have um, like these light machines where the light will just go back and forth or they have these buzzers 
and the buzzer will buzz back and forth to get that cross uh, lateral activity occurring. And so I like using the buzzers that tends to, I, I don't know, I think it's more effective than doing the light thing. But again, when working with a client, I would present to them, here are the different options that we can do when using this therapy approach, which one makes the most sense for you or which one do you want to try and then go from there. Um, there are different apps available for this and you can actually get apps where um, instead of like hand tappers or buzzers, it will actually do a sound in like this year, this year and back and forth. Um, so that's an alternative option as well. So there's a bunch of different ways to utilize this approach. Um, this is one of those trainings that you, if you're interested in, you need additional training. You have to go get a certification to actually be able to utilize this with therapy. But again, it is something that's become, it's an approach that's become very popular recently. Mindfulness, so mindfulness therapy approaches have also exploded with this third wave. Um, mindfulness is the awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment. So right now, non-judgmentally, kind of going back to Gestalt, right? It's not focusing on the future. It's not focusing on the past, but it's just being present right now. And again, this can be helpful because um, we ourselves, our clients often are not paying attention to what's going on right now. We're often so focused on what's happening next or, you know, oh, I regret doing that in the past. Um, and so when I incorporate this into therapy, I don't, I don't tend to incorporate it as like, oh, let's be Zen Buddhist monk. It's more so how do we increase awareness of what's happening? How do we try and be more present? Kind of going back to that gestalt approach that we've talked about previously and increasing that and by doing so, helping the client to become more aware of what they're thinking, um, especially if there's any negative thoughts that are occurring, what they're feeling positively or negatively, and then using that information to move towards their goals, to engage in behaviors that they want to be engaging in, um, to become more fulfilled in life, etc., that, that type of thing. Dialectical behavioral therapy. So this was developed by Marsha Linehan in the 90s. It has been rigorously studied. She spent a significant amount of her life um, developing and focusing on this therapy approach. It was developed to treat individuals diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. This is another one of those therapy approaches that we could spend, you know, there's whole certifications and week-long trainings on this. Uh, so I'm going to say if you want to learn more information about it, go find more information about it. Acceptance and commitment therapy. So ACT is yet another therapy approach that has come out of this third wave. And again, that you could spend days or weeks learning about in terms of doing workshops, doing trainings. ACT is a lot of fun because it focuses on um, a lot of times our clients are experiencing psychological inflexibility. And the purpose of ACT is to move towards psychological flexibility. So what do I mean by that? A lot of times our clients will say things or have thoughts like things have to be done this way or things should be done this way or I have to do things or I must or I should or etc. Um, and so moving the client away from that inflexibility, that like rigidness towards a more flexible approach. This approach also incorporates value exercises, so focusing on values, um, which I think we talked about maybe week one or two. I had you guys talk about your values. It incorporates metaphors, and a big part of this therapy approach is focusing on being committed towards action or taking action as opposed to being inactive or not taking the action towards the client's goals or towards who they really want to be. So self as context, this is one of the metaphors or exercises that I would work through with a client. So self as context essentially says we are not our thoughts, we are not our feelings, um, but rather it's a way to kind of take a step back and look at the bigger picture as opposed to getting so wrapped up in, you know, what our thoughts are, what our feelings are. Similar to mindfulness, it's kind of this sense of noticing with openness and curiosity. Um, and I put a picture of a sky here. And so self as kind context is kind of this idea of the sky. So the sky is always present. It's always there, whether we can see it 
if it's sunny out or whether we can't see it because of say a bad thunderstorm or clouds the sky is always present kind of the same with ourselves right we are always present um, self is context who we are is there regardless of whether we're experiencing negative emotions or positive emotions or regardless of what behavior we're engaging in or what we're doing um, and so it can be an, a unique way to help the client kind of take that step back, get some perspective. Uh, and if this were a metaphor that I were using with a client or in therapy, I might say something like, you know, um, observing the self is like the sky while thoughts, sensations, and or images are like the weather. So self is equivalent to the sky and then thoughts, sensations, images are equivalent to the weather. The weather might change. You know, some, di some days there's going to be clouds in the sky. Some days there's going to be thunderstorms. Um, but no matter if there's severe weather occurring or if it's sunny out, the sky is always there. You are always there. You are always present regardless of what those emotions or thoughts are. Um, and as time passes, the weather will change again and again. But regardless of that, the sky remains the same. It's always there. It's always present and it's unchanging. And so using that as an example to help the client explore, all right, well, I am me regardless of what emotions I'm experiencing or regardless of what thoughts I'm having. Another way to approach this or another exercise, um, and this is one that you guys could choose if you want to, is um, having the client fill in the blanks here. So if I were filling this out, I might say something like, um, I'm a psychologist. I would write psychologist in that first blank. I would say I'm sitting down right now and I would say I'm happy today. Now, um, if I were working through this exercise with a client, I would say, now I'm going to ask you to cross out that first word that you put. So for me, I would cross out psychologist. Why am I crossing that out? Well, um, I am me regardless of whether or not I'm a psychologist. I won't always be a psychologist. Someday I'll retire um, and being a psychologist is a role that I'm playing right now, but it's not one that I will always fulfill. So, you know, then I would explore with the client, what does crossing that word out feel like? Um, what What is that experience like? What thoughts or, or emotions are you having? Uh, and then I would cross out, um, I am sitting down right now. Well, because I am me, regardless of whether I'm standing up, whether I'm sitting down, whether I'm working out, I'm always going to be me aside from whatever behavior I'm engaging in. Um, and then lastly, I would cross out, I am happy right now. Um, I would just cross out the happy right now because I am me regardless of whether I'm happy or sad or any other emotion I'm experiencing. So once you have the client cross out those things that are um, in the underlined portion, what's left on the page is I am. So essentially helping the client explore that I am me regardless of what descriptors I assign to myself or what adjectives I assi assign to myself. So um, a big point of this exercise is we tend to hold on so tightly to these words that we use to describe ourselves. Um, but if we take a step back and think about, well, who am I outside of those de descriptors or outside of those words? I am still me. I am still whole. I am still who I am without those specific descriptors. Um, and so again, ACT being very moving towards cognitive flexibility, this can be a helpful exercise for clients um, to kind of get away from those descriptors or those ways that we always describe ourselves and say, okay, who am I outside of those things? I don't have to hold on so tightly to those descriptors. Um, this can be a really interesting exercise, especially for individuals who are, um, who are say, parents. You know, I'll ha I've had students write, I am a mom, I am a parent, I am a sister, I am a brother. Um, and so exploring through that, well, what does this look like when my kids grow up and move away and I'm an empty nester? Or, you know, who am I outside of whatever that role is that I've assigned myself or that others have assigned to me? Metaphor. So again, ACT uses a lot of different metaphors in therapy. And so this one focuses on acceptance versus avoidance. And you can imagine that a lot of times our clients um, come to therapy and they've spent a lot of time avoiding things. 
whether that's avoiding situations in their lives or avoiding emotions that they don't want to experience or um, avoiding thoughts about themselves such as, you know, um, I'm not a good person or um, I don't like who I am or whatever those things are that they're avoiding. And so this is a metaphor that I would go through if I'm noticing that a client is doing a lot of avoiding as opposed to accepting. And so I would say something like, you know, sometimes it seems almost impossible to sit with our feelings. And so I'd like you to imagine something that might help you understand what I mean by making room for our experiences or accepting our emotions as opposed to avoiding them. So imagine that you're walking home from work and You know, you've walked this path before, you're going through the neighborhood, you're familiar with this area, um, and you hear something behind you, and it's coming up on you, and it sounds like this big, massive monster. You hear these massive wings flapping and this jaw crunching and grinding, and it sounds really terrifying, and it sounds like it's this huge monster that's going to get you, and so you just start running, and you start running as fast as you can, but you can hear this thing coming up behind you. And so you're trying to run away from it and get as far away from it as you can. And, you know, you, you're running and you've been running and this thing, it just keeps, it's back there and it, it, do, it doesn't seem like you're getting any farther away from it. Um, and so, you know, you've been running for a couple of miles now, you're all sweaty. What happens when you're running? Well, in addition to you, you know, being all sweaty, you're starting to get tired. Can you do other things while you're running? Probably not, right? You can't take phone calls for business or work. You can't spend dinner with your loved ones or hang out with your friends or watch TV or do things that you enjoy doing because you're spending all this time and energy running from whatever this thing is chasing you. And so you've been running for miles. You know, if you're a runner, maybe you made it 10 miles, but for the rest of us, maybe we made it two or three miles or maybe five or six miles if we're really lucky and we're exhausted and we're tired and we're covered and drenched in sweat. And we finally get to the point where it's like, I can't breathe. I'm so out of breath. I'm just going to turn around this face, this thing. And if it gets me, then it gets me. And so you turn around and you are faced with this mosquito. And, you know, you've realized that you've been running for miles to avoid this thing that you thought was this massive, scary monster, only to realize that it's a mosquito. And are mosquitoes annoying? Yeah. If, if if the mosquito, you know, takes a bite out of you and it's going to be annoying because it itches or it's irritating, but was it worth running for miles and miles and all of this energy and effort that you put into trying to get away from it? Probably not, right? It was probably way more energy than it was really worth to avoid. Um, and so then having the client and exploring with the client, what does that look like in terms of the things that they're avoiding in their lives? Um, emotions or feelings or situations or whatever it is and exploring is it worth the energy and effort that they're spending towards um, you know avoiding anxiety or avoiding sadness or um, you know having a conversation around is running away actually being helpful is it getting them towards what they want is it helping them achieve what they want out of life or is it just them wasting energy and they're not doing the things that they really want to be doing, such as spending time with family or, um, you know, taking care of stuff at work or whatever it is. Um, and so, yeah, it can be, uh, metaphors can be fun in that sense to use because it's just a different way to approach something that we would be talking about in therapy already, but it, it gives it a different spin and it helps the client realize like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm doing in my life. And that's maybe not really serving me the way that I want it to, or it's not really helping me or moving me in the way that I want it to. And so what are some other behaviors or some other things that I can try or practice or do that's more in line with who I want to be, or that's more in line with, um, you know, where I'm trying to get to or my goals or that type of thing. So if you really like this metaphor, uh, you know, look up act metaphors. There's a ton of different metaphors both if you just type it into a search engine and if you want to find a couple on YouTube. There's a lot of different examples out there. So that is what you're going to be doing for this discussion post is um, taking one or two of those different exercises from this week. Practice the exercise. Go actually do it. Um, That's why this lecture is maybe a little bit on the shorter side-ish. 
because uh, I really want you guys to spend some time actually doing a couple exercises and then write about that as your discussion post. And that's it. Let me know if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thanks for watching.